So, hi, I'm Guy. My name is actually Guilherme. It's quite a complicated name to say, so let's stick with Guy. That's why it's in parentheses. I'm the CEO and founder of Worthix, and I've been working with a customer survey technology since 1999. Basically, in 1999, I created what was probably the first customer survey technology in the world, uh, but I was doing this back in Latin America. Uh, SurveyMonkey was doing the same thing in California, so they're a little bit luckier. Uh, and, uh, and after like several years working with the big enterprises uh, uh, deploying surveys, uh, I noticed that the market was missing the why behind the buy while deploying surveys. And that's when in 2014, I decided to move to Silicon Valley, San Francisco to start Worthix. Uh, and I'm here to present to you guys a little bit about that. But before we get into that, I would like to challenge you to think that we're living in the most violent economy in the history of capitalism. And sometimes when I say this, people say, hey, but like, aren't you exaggerating? And I say, no, take a look. It took only nine years for a company to be created in the automotive industry and to be bigger than Ford Motors. Nine years only, okay? That's super fast. And it took only seven years for Nokia, that a company that had 51% market share, a valuation of over $150 billion and 112,000 people, not to mention a bunch of PhDs and Harvard degrees, MBAs, blah, 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 basically to leave the market. So they're gone. So what I'm trying to say is that nobody is safe. No matter the size of your company and how important you think your company is, you can fail in the next three, four, five years or less because it's getting faster and not slower. So the question is, are you ready for the customer experience economy and why all companies are now giving attention to customer experience uh, more than ever? It's basically because of value proposition commoditization. So all companies from startups to large enterprises, they have access to the same brains, to the same capital and to the same technology, right? So the problem with value proposition commoditization is that that leads to price wars. When you have value proposition commoditization with empowered customers, then you have price wars. And the best way to make price less relevant is by innovating customer experiences. That's why people spend more in iPhones than other phones sometimes, even when the other phones have better features. It's because of the experiences. So, and there's another problem, which is most companies believe themselves to be customer centric, but we all know that customers don't perceive that way. And the problem is, Everybody's measuring the same thing over and over again. Most companies know what customers are buying, when they're buying, how much they're spending, but they don't know why. Why people are choosing one thing than another. So here's the list of some of the companies that are now adopting our technology. Uh, so I'm talking about some of the market leaders of their own industries, and they were visited by us, they saw our value proposition, and they decided to join and start innovating using our technology. So, and why they're doing this? Because they want to be the best option, because that's your challenge. No matter the company you work for, or no matter the team or position you work for, we all should make sure that our companies are the best options when customers are looking for solutions that we can sell them, either a product or a service, right? But the thing is, when we think about being the best option, we're trying to understand our customers to basically help with their expectations. We usually think about basic quantitative methodologies like CSET and NPS. But the problem with these metrics is that they are not focused on explaining customers' decisions. They can tell if your customers have positive or negative emotions with your current value proposition, but they cannot tell you about the next thing. They cannot actually uh, correlate with the why behind the why. And here's an example. BlackBerry in 2009, who remembers BlackBerry? <laughs> their customer satisfaction and NPS were peaking while they were losing most of their clients. And James Cornett was a guy work at, working at Cantor, I guess, at that time uh, in, a, in a project with, with Rem, and now he's working with us. And he said, like, there's so many things behind that, but mostly it's because they, they were not able to see what was going on. So they were not able to shift their mindset in time. Uh, and the same thing just happened with Toys R Us. They had a higher satisfaction and NPS than, than the Apple Store, but they're gone. So when we start researching to create Worthix, we were trying first to find a metric, and we found that the last and most powerful conclusion human beings have before making a decision, it's if something is worth it or not. Because you're not only looking to one side of the coin, which is the benefits, 
positive or negatives, you're also looking to relative comparison, to relative cost, relative effort. Okay, and then we found that great correlation when people say that something is worth it or not and their actual decisions. But that was just part of the challenge because you have to make sure that you're keeping up with the speed of change, not only measuring the why behind the buy or having a score that measures the why behind the buy, but you have to understand what you should do next. So when you're choosing a static survey, a survey that you're designing question one, two, three, four, and five, you're basically not being able to follow or understand the, the dynamics of the market. And if you all agree that the market is dynamic, by using a static instrument, you're not gonna be able to keep up with the speed of change. So that's when we decided to create a technology that it's a self-adaptive survey. So it's a survey that it's going to dialogue with the clients based on the things they wanna talk about. And because we use AI, and, and the survey is basically addressing the things that customers want to talk about, the survey takes only two minutes. So not only there's no need to design the questionnaire because the survey is going to talk to the customer about whatever they want, but there's no need, uh, it only takes two minutes of the, of, of the customer's time. And the secret sauce behind Worthix is Lucy. It's our girl. It's our AI. Okay, that stands for listen, understand, converse, and improve. And basically what Lucy is doing is empowering companies to build scalable and continuous one-on-one -on -one conversations. Imagine, I don't know, for, for companies that are here, if you have hundreds of thousands of customers or, or millions of customers, imagine being able to build one-on-one -on -one conversations with each one of them. That's what we do. So now I'm gonna show quickly a case study, very quickly because I only have three minutes, uh, of Hoover. It's, a, it's basically a, a vehicle. It's a blind study, okay, from an automotive company. And here we have, on the, on the top left side, uh, the worth index for this product, for this car. So imagine that 3,000 people participated in this survey after they purchased the vehicle, after they were using the vehicle for a while, and we can see that their worth index, which is that number, it's 75. That's the most important number we have in the platform because whenever that number fluctuates up and down, we can find financial correlations with your customer's decisions. Here on top, these drivers, you can see the sentiment of your customers, but this rank is not ordered by sentiment, it's ordered by impact, meaning that your customers are choosing this vehicle mostly because of quality, then brand identification, then social proof, then relative price, by the way, they're not that sensitive to price, and then relationship. But look, relationship has an amazing score in terms of sentiment, like 78, not amazing, but like a very good score. Why is it in the last position? Basically because we know that if you change the experience about relationship and make your customers feel more well-treated for this particular product, you have less impact in their decision of saying that you're worth it or not than by changing experience about quality. And the thing is, what quality means to me and what quality means to you is different. Right? So basically what we can do is we can open a list that it's gonna summarize in the top 15 most impactful items that Lucy discussed with your clients. The top 15 actionable insights of the things you, you can do. So on top of the list, we have fuel economy. So a lot of customers actually, 17.4% of customers spoke to Lucy about fuel economy and 13% of them made compliments uh, and 4.3% percent made improvement suggestions. And the, the, the key there is not the percentages, it's the impact. On the side, you can see IP and DP. That means that we should not put money to make fuel economy better because that's not likely to make the worth index go up. However, if we make that worse, the worth index is gonna go down. So that's an experience that we have to keep doing. That's one of the reasons why our score is 75. So it's an experience that we cannot fail. So everything that it's in green are the experience we cannot fail. Everything that it's in red are the experience we have to do better because that's where our customers expect, expect us to do better. Uh, if you click on any of these experiences, you can actually see the part of the text that Lucy read and understood that represented, for example, vehicle media system. So going back, if I click in vehicle media system, I can actually read. Whatever it's in red, it's the part of the text that it's an improvement suggestion. Whatever it's in, in green, it's a compliment. Going down, I'm just gonna fast forward to this table here. We can also show something that it's very unique, which is a competitive landscape. It's almost like an, a SWOT analysis because Lucy's gonna talk to relative competitors as well. And here we have a list on the first column of the top of mind competitors. So competitors are mentioned the most. And in the, in the other columns we have uh, uh, the drivers, right? So the first line is considering the response of all of the respondents. And whatever it's in green, it's because your company is getting a better score from customers thinking about the Ford Explorer. So Hoover has a better evaluation for customers thinking about Explorer. 
Durango and Fort Judge, meaning that these competitors here, they're basically a threat by presence, not by value proposition. However, Toyota Highlander, even though it has only 2%, it, 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 had, it represents way more of a threat for this product, okay? So I'm, I'm out of time. I, I could keep talking, telling about many other cases, but thank you so much and thanks Professor Marcus for the opportunity. Thank you.